So I do believe this is where we last left off. And this, once again, is just really a review, and I don't know where I got it. I like the pictures of mitochondria, though, um, or mitochondrion, technically, just to show you, kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. And then this is just another little cartoon to give you an, an example of what's happening. They just don't, they don't show you complex two. Complex two would be this right here. Okay, all right. And this does a good job of showing how the, it's called coupling of electron transport chain to the oxidative, the oxphos pathway because once again, the whole purpose is you pump these protons across you get this gradient, and then the protons, it does look like a turnstile where it will force the formation of ATP from ADP. <clears throat> uh, some of the other terms, chemiosmosis, this is something that's used to call it a chemiosmotic gradient or something like that, just in case you heard that term. Okay. This is what the ATP synthase looks like. This one I think is technically based off of something similar from E. coli, but um, they, they do have proton gradients as well. <clears throat> okay, so this is why I say it looks an awful lot, to me, like a turnstile, because what happens is, let me see, I've got a better picture, another picture coming up. Well, that shows it in greater detail later on. It's this, first of all, since they're, from the way that this is pictured, on this side, is this the intermembrane space or is this the mitochondrial matrix? Since there are lots of protons already here. That's the intermembrane space. And they are, it's kind of hard to tell, but they go through this little turnstile here and it literally causes this to wrap around. And that's called the stator protein. And it kind of looks like a little ratchet. And it goes between the subunits. There are three alpha and three beta subunits. They are not, that doesn't indicate that they're alpha helical versus beta sheets. They're just called alpha and beta. And it's the positioning between them, the three positions between each pair that is important to where the reaction occurs. And so that kind of helps hold it in place. Okay, but we'll see the way that this looks. Let me see if I can get it to. I don't know if it'll work with me on here, then let me show you the video. I really like this video. It's of course, it's gonna make me search for it, I'm sure. Let's see if I can get this video to come in and work. I think if I do it this way, nope, not that one, this one. <laughs> I have to put this in by hand, which is always a lot of fun, because if I don't, www.youtube.com. Actually, maybe it'll let me, if it's fast enough, it'll let me, oh, don't do that. The mobile one. It's called ATP Synthase Top View. There is no sound on this one. This is it. Okay. Oh, that is awesome. It does work. <laughs> okay. So you can see that the alpha and the beta subunits, they're showing it from the top. And this is the in between. And we'll go through each what these mean later on. But what happens is what had been a nifty spot, ADP and an inorganic phosphate goes through. Of course, the proton is flowing through, you don't see the protons. It moves, causes the turnstile, and it forces the ADP, inorganic phosphate becomes ATP, moves again, this will lead to become the empty spot once again. So each time, and this is that the gamma protein, which is what actually literally works just like a ratchet or you don't see the stat on this one, but as the protons move through, which you can't see protons on a crystal structure, but it causes it to move, and it literally causes that conformational change, which I think is really cool. So that's why it's, because ATP, usually it likes to be hydrolyzed, because it's happier, you know, you think back to entropy and resonance and all the reasons why they say, 
Um, but the tap is ADP in, in, phos in inorganic phosphate. So it literally forces it, like that pressure, if you want to think of it that way, forces it together by the movement, by that little turnstile that goes through. And we'll, we'll talk about what happens whenever the turnstile doesn't work later on. Because there are certain benefits, actually, whenever there's certain kind of you don't want the turnstile to work as well. Mm -hmm. At each spot. And so when we get later on, we'll talk about they use DP, TP, and E. Um, uh, some places I think call it AP and E or APO or something like that. that that's not so important. But at, at any point in time, you've got three binding sites. One binding site is going to be empty or open. One binding site is going to have the two coming together, the ADP and the intermediate phosphate, and one will have the newly formed triphosphate. Then it moves. It's like the little twin cell will switch, and this one will leave, and so now it's open. That one will be the one where the ADP and the inorganic phosphate comes in, and then this one is the one that had an ADP and inorganic phosphate to the ATP. And so that's why it's really efficient. Because if you think about it, you think back to anatomy physiology, just for every muscle contraction, here's that little bead of pearls, it takes an eight, at least one ATP, every little bead of pearl to move that muscle, that little finite. Space. And so it doesn't move that, move your pinky, you know, you've gone through lots and lots of ATP. And so you constantly have to make this and make this. <clears throat> um, and then, this one I think does have music to it. Oh, what happened? What? <laughs> okay, but let me see if I can find it. Let's see, where's the back? That's the bad thing about doing this. Um, back, ATP synthase. It's called ATP synthase. Unfortunately, it's not very. Oh, yeah. They should be ashamed of themselves, but still. Oh, I don't. Well, I don't know how well I'm picking up the music. So they're trying to show that there's the three changes every time it goes through. Plus, they're happy. And the guy in the middle is to be the gamma. Okay. There you go. <laughs> oh, it's so wrong. <laughs> and don't you like the fact that they do the the credits on who the gamma was versus beta one, beta two, and beta three? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dance direction. That's really sad. Okay. Now let's see here. Let me see if I can go back through. I want to make. I think we covered everything on this. With just a awesome. So this is just to show the fact that it is called the coupling process. It takes in in that way. Remember we use the word transducer at the beginning of towards the beginning of the semester, which is literally where you take one form of energy and you make it to something else. So it literally takes a electrochemical energy to do the physical work, the physical chemical work to make that new bond to make ATP. And it's ATP synthase. Not synthetase. Once in a while, you hear people mispronounce and it says, Yes, it takes ATP. It's not, the ATP is being made, but it's not using ATP for the energy. That's why technically it's a synthase and not a synthetase. Uh, and once again, it has, there are multiple proteins that are involved. Uh, the one in, bio, in E. coli, and sometimes you hear them called F0, F1, or F0, F1 ATPase. It's because these, F, these ATPases are not only in mitochondria. There are other ones that are similar to that where they break apart ATP. And they call, let me get this backwards. But in mitochondria, I want to see that this was the F0 or F0. Now it's called the F1 protein. I may have them switched. So if you ever hear that, um, then that's what they're talking. I'm just talking about this shape, which kind of looks like a mushroom to me. And if you draw like a mushroom, the, the head of the mushroom is always on the side of the mitochondrial matrix. The stalk would be on the side, that's because that's the turnstile part, that would be on the side of the 
uh, inner membrane space. All right, so yeah, the fancy term for it's chemiosmotic coupling. Uh, I've already said all of this in other ways before. The protons take up pro uh, prote proteins take up protons from the mitochondrial matrix, and it's important to know which complex it is, complexes are involved. They are complexes. Because I'm going to just give the numbers. The ones that are involved are complexes one, three, and four. Okay, so that's the reason why if you start with FADH2, you don't see complex one, so you don't put as many protons across. Because complex two does not go all the way across, and it does not shuttle protons from the matrix to the intermembrane space. And as I mentioned here, coenzyme Q, NADH, oxygen, they all require the protons. <clears throat> okay. This is just the same picture that we have seen in the past, but it's just blown up. Once again, to show you, gives you an idea of the kind of thing that we're going to be talking about. Um, because the electrons are not transferred directly across from NADH directly to coenzyme Q, they actually get shuttled through various intermediates. <clears throat> There's something in between complex three and coenzyme Q called the Q cycle. We'll go into it in greater detail because it's, it's much more complicated. It's not that coenzyme Q just gives the electrons off to cytochrome C. So we're gonna actually utilize that property of coenzyme Q to where it can pass off one electron at a time. And in doing so, it doesn't short circuit. You don't ever run out, okay, which is really important because you don't want to short circuit. Otherwise, what would happen if you short circuit, you would die quite possibly. And actually, people, people do die from cardiomyopathies and things, mitochondrial defects. And then cytochrome C, once again, jumps over to complex four where Ultimately, the electrons get passed off to oxygen to make water. And then all of these, and I don't care so much that you know the stoichiometry, because some people will argue four versus two or four versus two here and there, but you just need to know it's multiple protons that go from here to that side to the intermembrane space at complexes one, three, and four, okay? It's not even just one proton. So... <clears throat> Right, because this is only from NADH. If it was FADH2, what it would look like would be similar to this. This would be complex two, and here would be FADH2 to FAD. Um, and that's the proton, and we'll talk about what happens on the inside here. In coenzyme Q, the Q cycle would still exist on this, but we don't pump any electron, um, any protons across. Okay. Shape up complex yeah, no, they just showed it as a blob. Okay. We're gonna talk about it, because we're gonna actually see what it looks like based off of the known crystal structures. Um, and there are parts of it they, they don't know. They just know that some of them they based off of electron microscopy, so it's not, it's a much lower resolution. Mm -hmm. So with the Q cycle, does that only happen in complex three, or is that? <laughs> that is a debate. <laughs> we know for sure it happens in complex three. Can I jump the gun, tell them into the story again? The, remember complex one kind of looks like Florida or a gun? There is a putative Q cycle that also occurs in complex one. Some people have theorized or have, have hypothesized that it occurs there. They haven't been able to prove it yet. They don't know all the details of what's happening in complex one. So that's why it's kind of a point of contention. They say, oh, quite possibly. We'll explain. This is even an oversimplification of the Q cycle. It, this entire process, the Q cycle, is really, I mean, it's hard. It, it's, it's not easy. And I don't actually like the figure that's in your book. Because it, I mean, I worked on the Q cycle and I took a, it took me a little while to try to understand what they were trying to show you because I find it kind of confusing. But it is, it's, it's a little bit tricky. But I, I'll try to explain it to you. This is complex one. See, it kind of looks like Florida. If you flip it around, or it kind of looks like a gun. 
Glass is half full, glass half empty. <laughs> okay, so that's why now if you go back to your big picture, the one that you may be drawing on the sheet of paper as you go along, or I suggest that we kind of, you want to draw something similar to this. Okay? It's not so important to me that you know, oh, there's one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight iron sulfur centers involved. Okay? <laughs> but that the fact that there are iron sulfur centers. And so I'm going to take you through this. And there's a figure towards the end of this presentation that I love because, you know, I also worked in extra crystallography as an undergrad, but they've done, they've been able to crystallize this portion of complex one. It's hard to crystallize proteins that are really hydrophobic that are inside the lipid membranes because of the fact that once you pull them out, they don't like to keep their structure. And, or they won't stay still long enough. And so they don't really know what it looks like up here on the crystallographic. But then towards the end of this, uh, towards this lecture, I don't know if it'll be today or, or on Monday or what day, but it puts all of the crystal structures in that are known. And you can kind of see it. It's, I mean, it's just really, it's really cool. At least I think so. The biochemistry nerd will come out. And hopefully I can stir your own inner biochemistry nerd by the end of the semester. All right. Mm -hmm. Question just point of clarification. Before, earlier you were saying how ubiquinone Q um, and then it becomes semi semiquinone mm -hmm. cycle and then uh, ubiquinol. Yes. Is it, so that is separately the Q cycle? That's part of it. Okay. But mm -hmm. that but that is only occurring, I just want to make sure, not in the because for some reason I have to maybe I misread, but it ends up figure one. So those occur at complexes one, two, and three. The Q cycle, that's why, is more in depth. You see all three of those structures in the Q cycle, but the Q cycle is different. Those are the three possibilities, and those do occur at complexes one, two, and three. <clears throat> all right, so the way that this, whoa, I just spit on the iPad. Uh, So the way that this works is, whoops, we've been collecting, you know, all these NADHs from glycolysis and, well, eventually from, you know, fatty acid uh, catabolism and, and, and the various dehydrogenases. Any of them, when we try to make them the NADHs, we're going to now pass off those electrons. And like I said, the electrons don't go directly to coenzyme Q. See, coenzyme Q is way up here in this panhandle region, <laughs> to stick to our Floridian vernacular, the panhandle region, um, or the arm, that's where Q is at. So what happens, and, and it's one way to also regulate this entire process, is the first recipient's FMN. And FMN looks an awful lot. I mean, it's essentially identical to FADH2. It's just missing the A. Okay, it's missing that nucleotide. And so FMN takes the electrons, then the electrons are shuttled from one iron sulfur center to another. It just goes between all these sulfur center, iron sulfur centers. And remember, this isn't a single protein. There are lots of proteins here that come together in these complexes. So that's why this little picture here is trying to show you, and I, I mean, at least I think it's cool. You can see this would be where the NADH would bind to pass off the electrons. And, you know, whenever I taught organic chemistry, or engine chemistry, especially organic chemistry, I tell you, you know, you don't show just electrons flying off. This is one time when it kind of is the electrons flying off. It's because this isn't an organic reaction. This is an inorganic one. And so, or electric reaction. And so you can see it goes to the FMN, then they go from one iron sulfur center to the next iron sulfur center, all the way to this other protein. They, they call this protein N2. It too is an iron sulfur protein, so it contains iron and sulfur. And what it does is it moves the electrons from this whole series here to the waiting coenzyme Q. And that's why this is trying to show you it goes from Q to QH2. Notice they don't show the QH dot, the semiquinone, because they don't know exactly how N2 
passes it off. But it's believed, some have hypothesized, that it's something similar to a Q cycle, if not a Q cycle. And like I said, right now that may not make sense what the Q cycle is until we get to complex three, where it's highly known. But these are the players. Another, another term or verbiage that gets used in mitochondrial proteins or mitochondrial uh, vernacular is rather than saying matrix and intermembrane space, sometimes they call it N and P for negative side and positive side, which should make sense now since all the pro not all, but protons are being pumped to the intermembrane space side, it's more positive, and so they call that the P side. The matrix side is called the N side because it's a negative, it's more negative on the inside of the mitochondria in that holy of holies. And so don't be surprised if both in your book or in things that you read, or if I sometimes say that as well, if we say the inside means the matrix side, not the intermembrane side or the P side. Um, during this process here, this is where the protons get pumped out is in the panhandle. I'm sure those who are not from Florida would have no idea what we're talking about. Sorry to all my Arabic followers. Uh, but what happens here is in the process of making the, the quinol is you utilize some protons to make the quinol itself. Like that's the H2, but even more protons get shuttled from the matrix to the intermembrane space. <clears throat> it even has, kind of looks like an F for Florida. For first complex. Oh. When you get to medical school, you're going to use lots of mnemonic devices and things like that. Okay. So that's complex one. Um, now just keep in mind, because I wish I would have done it a little differently now. The electrons here, QH2 literally can, I hate to say float or swim, that's anthropomorphizing it, can go directly from complex one to complex three. The next slide, though, is going to show you complex two. Like, what happens if we started off with an FADH2? That's my little caveat. So we've actually seen this one. We just didn't see the structure. But this is complex two, which is succinate dehydrogenase from the citric acid cycle. And yes, technically, it's got one little alpha helix that, that sticks out up there, but the part that handles the electrons doesn't go all the way across. So that's why, notice, protons, hydrogens, do not go from one side all the way out here. They just, they don't. And so that's one of the reasons why you don't make as much ATP if you start off with FADH2. So that's why the answer to that question is no. No. Okay. And... Even when we were starting to discuss the citric acid cycle, remember I always said that everything happened in the mitochondrial matrix, except one of them was localized to the membrane, and this is that one that's localized to the membrane. <clears throat> okay. And so here what happens is you go from FAD to FADH2, and then once again, the electrons from FADH2, because you're gonna you want to make the FAD again, so that way the citric acid cycle keeps going on and on and on and on, is it transfers its electrons again to FES centers. Now this one, they were able to crystallize it with ubiquinone or ubiquinone analog in there. So you can actually see it. See, there's the tail, and that would be the quinol side. And so it literally accepts the electrons from the iron sulfur centers to become QH2, and then the QH2 swims, leaves, whatever metaphor you like to use, um, we'll go on to complex three. Now, you know, there's a lot of things here. They're, they're showing you, these, this is just phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Those are phospholip a type of phospholipid that was co-crystallized. I wanna point out this, and what, what color is that? Red, in the red? See, that's a heme. Where, first of all, what is a heme? Where have we seen heme before? Hemoglobin, right? And so heme has an iron inside it that can also, just like in your blood, you know, whenever it, you had different oxidation states of iron, which also affected how well oxygen would be able to bind. 
That has an iron in the middle. You can't see it, but it's got an iron there. I really like this heme. This, well, you should really like be clad for this heme too. But if you notice, it's here, but it has, it looks like it has absolutely no part whatsoever with the electron transport chain, but it has a, it plays a very, very vital role. Z1, I like it because I got a good sports analogy for it. And so, what? Does anyone know, like, what could this heme be doing? It's, you know, it's in the part that's of the protein complex that's up inside the membrane. You know, the electrons are going here. They're going fast. I don't know the exact numbers. It's probably 100,000 times per second. So, I mean, something really, really fast that they're just applying through from FAD, iron sulfurs, ubiquinone to make ubiquinol so that way it can go on. It ca it's the catcher. It's like a catcher emit or a sponge or whatever thing. Because you can imagine, these electrons are flying. They do sometimes go astray. And you can, lots of things can be oxidized or reduced, including proteins, including you know lipids, and bad things would happen. And so what that does is the occasional one electron goes astray, it catches it, and then it tosses it back to the ubiquinone. And so it's there, sort of like the catcher in baseball. And so if it gets by the, the batter, then the electron will get tossed back. So I have it on the one. It's not involved in normal. This is sponge. <clears throat> or the catcher's mitt in order to keep electrons from making any type of reactive oxygen species. It's called lipoxidation, I think, whenever it does a lipid. Um, protein oxidation, I think it's a protein. I mean, in theory, it would also do bad things to DNA and RNA. It's just the fact that you don't have DNA or RNA right there. But electrons could do that too. Okay, so that's why that one's very important. All right. In the last couple minutes, I just want us to start on complex three. So on your big picture, you may be drawing this in. Complex three is, well, complex, for lack of a better word. I used to know, so we're not, I used to just tell you the exact numbers based off of like the human, because um, humans may have little slightly different numbers of units versus yeast or something like that, but I don't remember now. But it, there are lots and lots of proteins that all come together. And not only that, but one whole set of complex of proteins has to come together with another whole set of complex of proteins to make a dimer of polymers. Because some of the important parts, I'm gonna to refer to the cartoon over here because it's a little, I can't tell the colors apart. But the, this is called the risky, risky, that's, called, that's pronounced risky, risky iron sulfur protein. It kind of, to me, looks like a hammer on a piano. You know, if you've ever looked at the, uh, opened up the lid of a piano, seen a baby grand or whatever. And what it does is it's going to come down and take one of the electrons at a time and flip it from this heme to cytochrome C. It comes back and forth. But the risky protein of one complex actually takes the electrons from the other complex since it's with the other one of the dimer. And so that's why we have two big complexes that always have to come together. The risky protein of one will actually take the electrons from the, its partner. And so it's kind of like you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And they, it literally does bend. It folds and bends. And like I said, for someone who's healthy, you have to do it 100 to 150,000 times per second. And it has to be fast in order for it to go. And ultimately, this outline here is cytochrome C, which is a protein, which has a cytochrome on it, which is what accepts that electron. But it can only do one electron at a time. And this iron sulfur protein can only do one electron at a time. But remember, quinol has two electrons, which is where the Q cycle comes into account. Because otherwise you'd have like a traffic jam or you could even short circuit it if you had to wait and just do a single electron at a time on something that's trying to give up two electrons. And so we'll talk about the ins and outs. Uh, just in general, more protons gonna be going across from the uh, N side to the P side. But uh, we're gonna talk about the Q cycle when, on Monday, okay?